Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, I was thrilled when Pastor Anderson asked if I would preach. Our second reading this morning is taken from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 4, verse 44 through chapter 5, verse 10. Here we read. And Jesus kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him, listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Peter, Simon Peter, saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his commandments, uh, companions were astonished at the catch of fish that had been taken. And so were James and John, the son of Zebedee and Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. In the first reading from Psalms this morning, the psalmist declares his love for the beauty of God's law. And perhaps you have never thought about God's law as being beautiful, but no doubt you have stopped to consider the beauty of the red and the amber and the bronze and the golden leaves of autumn. Certainly there were many families out yesterday enjoying the beauty and the nice weather. But have you ever considered that God's law is behind this beauty? And indeed, all order and all beauty, however humble, however grand, it goes without saying that without God's law, there would be no trees. And leaves would not turn color in the fall if the chemical processes within them were not ordered by God's law. If you love the beauty of autumn, and if you understand that this beauty is the product of God's law, then surely there should be a place in your heart for an appreciation of that law. In a very real sense, God's law is the very foundation upon which the universe was created. It is by God's law that all exists that has been brought into being by being separated from nothingness. That was the act of creation. And in order for all these created things to endure, they must conform to the law by which they are defined. And this includes the human soul. The penalty for not maintaining the pattern by which something has been created is the destruction, the, the coming apart, and the death of the thing that had been created. Destruction is the inevitable result of deviation from the law which defines us, the law by which we are separated from other created things and from the void itself. Let us consider, for example, a simple atom or a compound. Some of you may be chemists out there. I hope I get this right. God's law by which carbon was created, by which carbon was made, uh, determines that carbon exists by combining six protons and six neutrons. And if the carbon wishes to be carbon, it must retain six protons and six neutrons. Now let us suppose that we could somehow add two protons or two neutrons to the existing carbon atom. The carbon would cease to exist. It would no longer be carbon. 
In its place, we would have something entirely different, oxygen. If not conforming to the law by which carbon is defined, carbon ceases to exist. And the same principle applies to all created things. Let us say that we ourselves are the creator of a manufactured item. Let's say toothpaste, for example. And our chemists work up an excellent formula that distinguishes our product from the product of other manufacturers. The product is well received by the public and sales are doing very well. But wait, one day a serious error is made. The workers in our factory inadvertently deviate from our winning formula. The product is flawed. Customers complain. What can be done? The only thing that can be done is to recall the faulty product and destroy it because the deviation from the intended formula results in a product that is no longer our product. It is something entirely different. And such is the case with the human soul. The human soul was initially created in God's image, perfect and without sin. The law defining this perfect human soul demands that it remain perfect and without sin like God's, for we were created in God's image. Any departure from the pattern by which it was created would, by necessity, mean the destruction of the intended version of man's soul. The perfect soul would no longer exist once it had been corrupted because of sin the human soul is so distorted, so out of harmony with the law by which it is defined, created, that it no longer exists. And the penalty of the sin for this sin is death. And this saddens God. It saddens God because God loves us and wishes for us his most beautiful, his most wonderful and complex creation to be restored and to live with him forever. But there is an accuser who points out that because we no longer conform to the law by which we have been created, we must die. That is the law. What is God to do? He loves us, but we have become terribly flawed. The law cannot be set aside, for by that law, all that exists, including ourselves, was made and is sustained. If that law were taken away, everything would just disintegrate and go back into the void. God has a plan to both satisfy the law and at the same time save his beloved <coughs> humanity. Not that God is subject to the law, but every physical thing that has been created is subject to the law because the boundaries which define everything, the boundaries which separate that which is from chaos that existed before God created the heavens and the earth. While the law is beautiful to those who recognize its true purpose, the human mind is, quite naturally, greatly intimidated by the law. We look at ourselves in comparison to the perfection of God's law, and we find ourselves to be wholly inadequate and worthy of destruction punishment. There is an inner awareness in all of us, if only dimly perceived, that we are indeed sinful creatures. We are unable to measure up when examined in light of God's law. And our conscience recognizes this. Simply put, we wilt before God's law because of our awareness that we are so very imperfect when compared to the ideal that God intended. And such was the case for a simple fisherman who lived 2,000 years ago. Simon Peter had no doubt heard of Jesus, for Jesus had been pe preaching throughout Galilee, and news of him went out throughout the surrounding region. People were astonished by Jesus and his teachings because they recognized the truth of what he was saying and discerned that he spoke with authority. Jesus had also been healing persons, and the report about his healing ministry went out into every place in the surrounding Jesus. 
Now Jesus, we are told, had even healed this fisherman's mother-in-law. Jesus was no stranger to Simon called Peter, and he, he called him master when Jesus approached. Simon Peter recognizes in Jesus the true reflection of God, the perfection of God. And so it was on that day when Jesus approached Simon Peter and entered the boat of the fisherman, Peter felt totally inadequate in the Lord's presence. And falling down at Jesus' knees, he cried out, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Go away. Go away. I can't bear this. I am a sinful man. Now, being in the presence of the perfect embodiment of God's law had made Peter so uncomfortable that he could not bear his own sinfulness. And Peter was asking not so much to be shielded from Jesus, but rather from the awareness of his own sinfulness, which had been awakened within him by seeing Jesus in comparison to the perfect law of God, seeing himself in comparison to Jesus. The Apostle Paul sometimes speaks of God's law as the instrument by which we are condemned. And it most surely is. God's perfect law is the perfect weapon. It is the perfect weapon of our accuser. The law is. The accuser, the one who hates humanity because he is jealous of God's love for us. And the enemy of which Paul speaks is Satan, our accuser before God. Look here, the accuser says, day and night to God. Humanity does not conform to the law and must be destroyed. And to Peter and to each of us, the accuser says, look at yourself. You are an unrighteous sinner who cannot possibly be loved by God. Satan reminds us over and over of all of our failures. But the Apostle Paul reminds us that we have an advocate, an attorney, so to speak, a defender who places himself between the law and our inability to perfectly live up to the demands of the law. And this is God's wonderful plan for our salvation. Let's go back now to poor Peter. Jesus sits down with him in the boat, and Peter sees in the perfection of Jesus a stark contrast to his own imperfection. Satan, the accuser, is quick to remind Peter of his inadequacies in an attempt to separate Peter from the Lord. Jesus calls each of us, but unless we respond, we cannot be saved. Satan attempts to convince us that we are so flawed that God will never restore us. And if Satan succeeds, we will turn from God. Tell God to depart from us. And then Satan succeeds when we turn from God to tell God to depart from us as Peter did. At first, Peter does this, but the Lord does not depart. Jesus tells Peter that he can and he will use him in his ministry if Peter will follow him. The attempt of Satan to exploit Peter's feelings of inadequacy by accusing him of his sinfulness fails because of the love of God which Peter recognizes in Jesus. Ultimately, many persons fail to recognize that love and turn away from God's plan of salvation. I can't measure up. I can't make it. God won't, won't have me. I, I just, I'm not going to turn to God. Each and every day, Satan tries to separate us from God by reminding us of our sinfulness. Satan holds up a mirror, a mirror of God's perfect law to remind us of our inadequacies in an attempt to drive a wedge between us and the redemptive love of God. Satan wants us to become aware of our flaws and our inadequacies and to dwell on our flaws and our inadequacies so that he might exploit 
that awareness for his own purpose of separating us from the grace of God. It is important for us to understand that while the law mirrors the righteousness of God, Jesus mirrors the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. And it is very important for us to understand that Satan exists. Satan is real. And Satan is our adversary. Satan is our accuser and is intent upon destroying our faith in the power and the efficacy of God's redemptive love and his plan of salvation, Jesus Christ upon the cross. Satan is a deceiver, a destroyer, and he hopes to take control of our life for the purpose of destroying us, you. The target of Satan, the deceiver, is your mind. His weapons are his lies. His purpose is to make you ignorant of God's plan of salvation. He's working on that. Your defense is found in the teachings of the New Testament. The target of Satan, the destroyer, is your body. His weapon is suffering. His purpose is to make you impatient with God's providence. Your defense is the imparted grace of God. And the target of Satan, the ruler, is your will. His weapon is pride. His purpose is to try to make you independent of God's will. And your defense is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The target of Satan, the accuser, is your heart. The weapon, his weapon, is accusation. His purpose is to bring your attention to your attention, the indictment of God's law so that you might become discouraged, so that you might become hopeless, and so overcome by a feeling of despair that you will turn away from God and close your heart to his grace. Your sure defense is God's interceding son who is the atonement for our sin and the manifestation of God's love upon the cross. Take, uh, Satan takes something beautiful yet terrifying, the universal natural law, and uses it as a weapon against us. There are two possible fatal responses to that on our part. We can either shrink away from God, crippled by guilt, Peter's initial response, or we can turn away from the law entirely, by gaining a good feeling about ourselves by thinking there is no universe the law, probably there's no afterlife, probably there's no God, telling ourselves that all truths are relative, and even if I'm a sinner, so what everybody else is. And Satan is quite happy with either of these responses, both of them are fatal responses to our soul, but Satan's quite happy with it. And both of these responses are very common. The second one, that of denying that there is any real truth, is probably increasing, and it's commonplace uh, today. And the evidence of this can be seen in our secular culture today, which is becoming more and more hostile to Christianity. There is a third path. And that is God's plan of salvation. And this is open to each of us. And this path is effective in answering the accusations of Satan. The substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross, in other words, he died for our sins. This satisfies the demands of the law. It does, it's God's plan. Jesus, my son will die. That's gonna satisfy the law on our behalf. I mean, that's something that we ourselves cannot do. And if we understand this and if we accept this, we will neither be paralyzed by feelings of inadequacy, nor will we turn our backs to God in an attempt to deny it the validity of the law. We recognize that the natural law by which the universe was created is valid and inescapable. And we also recognize that the penalty for not living up to the law is valid and inescapable, and that we are simply incapable of living up to the law. But that God so loves us that he gave his only son 
that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It is then, and only then, that we are liberated from the power of the accuser and begin to see the law from a different perspective once we experience the deliverance from the law that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. We can begin to love the law as a guide for our behavior and to appreciate it as the framework upon which God's creation is based. And though we ourselves may never perfectly live up to the demands of the law, we can and should as Christians turn to Satan, the accuser, and say to him, get away from me, Satan. I am not yours. I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. And through him, my sins are forgiven. I have been adopted as a child of God whom God will never abandon. As a Christian, we come to love God's righteousness even though we have no righteousness of our own. Each day we strive to be like Christ because we love him. Though we realize that his love for us is sufficient to cover a multitude of sins. Satan's goal is to get us, get into our heart and get into our conscience and to trouble us through his many attacks upon us. Satan attacks our belief on God in God. Satan attacks our relationship with God. Satan seeks to drive us to despair. Satan hits at our heart and at our conscience. And I can tell you from personal experience that Satan can and will really work you over. He's after you. He will beat you up. He will accuse you of everything under the sun. The Apostle Paul was very much aware of this and urges Christians to defend themselves by putting on the full armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, we read, Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breast plate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the, in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Satan is still in heaven, using God's own law to accuse us and seek our condemnation because he hates God's creation. He hates you and me. Satan is seeking to reclaim all and to chaos. But God loves his creation and seeks to redeem it God loves us and has provided a plan of salvation which at the same time satisfies the law by which we have been created. And now, because of this wonderful plan, the cross of Jesus, we have an advocate with the Father. And by his stripes and through his blood, our sin debt has been paid. In Revelation chapter 12, verse, verses 10 through 12, we read, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Through God's great love, we, his beloved creation, have been freed to love God's law rather than fear it. 